Okay, everybody. Hello and welcome to this webinar. It's a Renew Economy webinar made with the support of Longi. And um, I hope we've got a really interesting hour um, ahead of us here. We've got some really great speakers. Um, the topic is how efficient can big solar be? And really, it's just a testimony to the amount of solar that we expect to join the grid. We've seen a huge influx over the last year or two or three even in rooftop solar and now in big solar and of course there is more to come. I'm going to give a brief welcome and overview um, of the solar and renewables industry and then we're going to be followed by David Dixon, the Senior Analyst Renewables Research for Rystide Energy, then Richard Chan, the Project Manager for Longi Australia, and then Andrew Blakers, the uh, Professor of Engineering at Australia National University. And um, then we're gonna take a question. So look, please, um, there's a little Q&A tab down on the right-hand side, on the bottom of the screen. Um, if you've got any questions, please put them there. Um, there's also a chat button that some of you have um, already taken advantage of. And uh, Richard, yes, we promise you an hour of gripping entertainment. Um, I noticed that you've sacrificed um, something else to, to join us, but we do appreciate everyone joining this podcast. And of course, we also appreciate the support of Longi Solar. So I'm going to give a really brief overview of the um, renewables industry. And look, in, many of, in many ways, it's the best of times and the worst of times. Of course, um, we've just recently had a... Um, I'm just going to share some um, a, a quick... Um, a quick presentation here that I've got um, and hopefully that works there. Just recently we had the AEMO integrated system plan that was presented um, probably about two weeks ago and it really just paints the most exciting future. It is a 20-year blueprint from the people whose job it is to keep the lights on and who have the engineering capability of how the grid will transition over the next 20 years. And in basically all their scenarios, we are moving from, you can see on the left-hand side of the screen, we're still at 20, 60% coal, and we're, most of that coal is gonna retire over the next 10, 15 years. There might be a little bit left in 2040, but essentially that's gonna be replaced by that big lump of green, which is wind energy, and that big lump of yellow, which is solar energy. AEMO forecast that in the step change plan, um, will be at 94% renewables by 2040 and 96% renewables by 2042. And solar obviously plays a major part in that. And even in their other scenarios, it is, um, it's, um, it gets to at least 70% wind and solar. So no matter what happens, we're moving to wind and solar because as they say, it's the cheapest and with storage, the most reliable option that, um, that we have. And that's great news. To get there though, we need a lot to be put into place and we need the engineering, we need the investment in the uh, capacity, the transmission capacity, we need the rules and regulations adapted to these new technologies and right now we are finding out to our cost what has happened when we don't do that properly. Um, the good news is that in small scale solar, which is basically most people's, um, most people's uh, what people are investing in on their homes, that's going absolutely gangbusters. It surprised even the industry and it's at record highs. We're going to go to more than two gigawatts. And I've got the wrong slide up there. I do ap apologize. That's the average system size. I've hit the wrong button. What I wanted to show was the amount of um, large scale um, or rooftop solar being put on, which is going to break 2.5 gigawatts, I think, this year, despite, um, despite all the COVID restrictions and all the other issues. Unfortunately, it's a bit of a different story on the large scale renewables, and I do have the right slide here. We are seeing that in the last, since two years ago, the level of investment has dropped off quite considerably. Now, a lot of that's got to do with a lack of federal guidance on policy. We don't actually have much of a policy in the federal level, and a lot of the grid connection problems. And this is a graph that's actually produced by the Clean Energy Council just yesterday as part of their um, investment uh, confidence index, and confidence is not high at the moment, mostly because of those grid problems. So um, that is the sort of the yin and the yang, if you like, of the uh, renewables in industry at the moment. Fantastic promise. We're just about to embark on a transition, but short-term issues and short-term problems. And I think we'll probably get um, some sort of indication from the others about um, where we're heading with that, particularly with David and his pipeline, um, his, his discussion about where we're at with the solar industry. Um, and also Richard um, looking at um, the technology itself. And that obviously is part of the good news, despite the grid problems we have in the policy um, vacuum, 
the technologies are moving forward at a great space and that's going to be one of the major parts of this webinar so look um thank you very much for listening to me i am now going to hand you over to our second presenter david dixon senior analyst at of renewables research at rystart energy david um you have the forum and thanks for joining this webinar Fantastic. Um, just confirming uh, everyone on the call can see my screen just before I kick off. I can see it. Beautiful. Awesome. So firstly, I want to thank Longy and Renew Economy for uh, inviting me to present today. Um, for those that uh, don't, know, uh, don't know me, I'm Dave Dixon. Uh, as Giles mentioned, I work at Rystad Energy as one of the analysts. My remit is the Australia utility scale renewables sector. And the one liner about essentially what we do is we're an independent uh, research firm and in the renewable space, we track all the utility scale PV wind and storage assets uh, globally. And that's essentially where all the data for uh, this presentation uh, comes from today. So without further ado, I'll give a bit of context about where Australia sits on the global stage with respect to utility uh, PV. And then a bit more of uh, the technology trends, the stakeholders and the challenges for the utility PV industry in Australia. Uh, keep in mind, this will be high level given the time. So feel free to uh, reach out to me with any questions if you'd like to discuss this in a bit more detail. So jumping right into the numbers, what you see on screen here are the top 20 utility PV countries by capacity. And uh, I'll note that utility PV is above one megawatt AC and is ground mount. This does not include rooftop uh, figures. So our remit is only uh, utility scale. So obviously Australia would move, uh, would increase quite significantly if you include rooftop figures. But what you'll notice here is uh, Australia's number 10 on the list. Uh, and this is uh, for total utility PV installed uh, under construction or beyond financial close. And so considering the population relative to a lot of the other nations on here, it's, it very much is yeah, quite impressive that you're even in the top 10. You'll also notice the top three markets, standouts, China, the United States and India, and that uh, about half of the nations in the top 10 are Asia Pacific. So Asia Pacific really is where the utility scale PV uh, is being deployed. But let's look at this on a more per capita basis. Uh, specifically for utility PV. So on the y-axis here, you see the utility PV capacity installed per person in watts AC uh, per person. And on the x-axis, we're plotting essentially electricity demand, uh, annual electricity demand per person for each of these nations. And uh, you'll notice that obviously, as you move further to the right, you're getting to the uh, energy, it's electricity intensive uh, economies, such as in South Korea and the United States, Canada and Australia and the UAE. Uh, mainly other resources or heavy industries. But it becomes actually quite clear that when you look at these top 20 utility PV nations, there's only three that are above 250 watts AC per person and re-emphasize no rooftop figures in these numbers. And when you think about the in investment environment two, three years ago, which resulted in uh, the, the numbers that you see here today, um, uh, these nations really represent or represented at the time uh, opportunity with respect to uh, the key factors that you'd need in order to invest in these utility PV facilities. So when you compare some of these um, considerations with say economies in Europe, uh, land and resource tend to be a little bit more of a challenge, specifically land with regards to economies like Japan and South Korea, resource in Canada is obviously a little bit challenged as well. And it does actually take quite a bit to move the needle for a market such as the United States or, or China. Where do these countries sit at, at a global level in terms of pricing for utility uh, PV, PPA prices? So on screen here, every dot represents an asset from, from our database. And uh, the x-axis is when the, the facility has fin oh, sorry, finished commissioning or is expected to finish commis commissioning. Uh, the y-axis here is PPA price in USD per, per megawatt hour. The bubble size represents the, the capacity of the facility. And uh, as you can see, obviously here, the dramatic cost reductions that we're seeing in utility PV around the world. And note that that's a log axis on, on the Y axis. So we, we, we've come down the learning curve in the past 10 years quite dramatically. The top uh, three nations we presented on the previous slide on a capita basis sit here. That's Australia, Chile, 
And uh, the standout here really is the UAE with that size and scale. Turning more to an Australia focus here, um, the, what you see on screen here is our assets, sorry, for the Australia markets. And each asset here is a utility PV asset. Uh, when it started construction uh, on the x-axis and the power of the modules essentially on the y-axis. And you can see here that even in the past three years, we're seeing these improvements in module technology. Uh, it should be noted as well that the color represents the type of technology being used for each of these modules. So uh, the cell design is essentially refers to the PERC or aluminium back surface field. Um, the, the type of silicon mono or multi-crystalline and whether or not they're the module is bifacial or monofacial. So at the present time for facilities that have started construction, we currently only have three facilities that are using uh, bifacial uh, modules at the present. But we're about to undergo a step, step change and um, I'm sure Richard will talk about this in a bit more detail. We, we're already starting to see announcements of 500 watt plus uh, modules from all the major manufacturers. And uh, as a basic rule of thumb for every 100 watts you increase uh, the module power, uh, your capex declines by three to five percent. Those are the basic numbers that, that we've uh, that we've determined. That's uh, I'll, I'll leave that uh, more for Richard to discuss. In terms of who are the players in the market in Australia, um, the top five utility PV developers by their equity ownership in these in their assets are shown in the top left hand corner. Uh, you see here Neon by far and away the market leader, and we're here, sorry, only talking about assets at or beyond financial close. These are uh, real assets and not just proposed assets. Neon by far and away the leader, but you see here the significance of that Western Downs facility on their pipeline, uh, closely followed by Versal, John Lang, and FRV. Um, you'd expect FRV to be the one to move up the list if uh, Sebastopol reaches financial close in the second half of this year. Note that of the top 20 developers in Australia, only three are Australian, so 17 are foreign, and they represent about 85% of the utility PV installed. So there is a lot of foreign interest in Australia. The total pipeline of utility PV in Australia is over 70 gigawatts. It's, it's just enormous. So only about one in 10 projects actually reaches financial close. These are the top five panel suppliers in the market at the present. Uh, one project moves you up and down the list very, very quickly, given the size and scale that the projects are now at. Uh, the Australia utility PV markets utilise a single axis tracking on about 85% of the capacity that we install. Uh, this is actually quite uncommon relative to our neighbours in the north um, and in the big markets such as China, India and Vietnam. Um, two companies, Next Track and Array Technologies, account for about three quarters of uh, single axis tracking uh, equipment provided to the utility PV industry in Australia. By far and away though, the most concentrated market segment is the inverter supplies. SMA currently have about 60% market share in, in Australia. And finally, to round out the stakeholders, uh, the EPCs, obviously quite a competitive uh, space in the utility PV sector. Uh, you obviously notice that um, these companies are no longer actively bidding in the EPC space with the um, the most well-known case probably being the RCR bankruptcy in 2018. Uh, and that leaves actually Sterling and Wilson as currently the top um, EPC that is still actively bidding in the market despite only winning their first project in Q4 uh, 2019. Last slide and I'll, I'll finish up just by uh, essentially highlighting some of the drivers and the challenges for the utility PV industry here. We do expect there to be a movement in the off-grid space. We've already started to hear some of the announcements from Rio Tinto, uh, Fortescue Metals Group, and, and not a lot of folk are aware that the off-grid industry, mainly mining and oil and gas, utilise about uh, or over 20 terawatt hours a year in Western Australia. So it's prime for, uh, prime for utility PV to enter. The challenges, and I'll only talk about the grid in the interest of time, um, I'll try and display the issues with network capacity and MLS and system strength on the right hand side with the chart you see on screen. The chart you see on screen, the x-axis is the financial year 2019 MLF uh, for each of the assets shown uh, in, in the triangles and on the y-axis is the AC capacity factor for that financial year. So essentially showing the performance of that asset relative to its location in the grid 
And you'll already notice that, and sorry, I've color coded these assets by where they're located. So for, an ex for example, North versus South Queensland, the green being South Queensland, you can see quite a distinct MLF di difference from those in the North. If we split this into four quadrants, you, if you're in the top right hand corner, you're essentially in the sweet spot. You're in a good location in the grid and your asset is performing um, essentially above expectation relative to, to all the others and probably in the area that you would have modeled. Um, so above 25% AC capacity factor. You move to the left and although your asset is performing well, your, your MLF suggests you're in a weaker part of the grid. And so you've got to wonder at what point uh, does system strength start to bite you and you potentially move in this direction. Uh, speaking of system strength, you notice that these assets here, these were all curtailed from September through to about March or April. And as such, they've really been hit in terms of the performance and the output they've been allowed to uh, generate to the grid. Further to the right, in the bottom right-hand corner, you notice that there are several assets here that have MLF above 95%, but are performing at capacity factors of 20% or below. And so here it's really down to how you, perhaps an equipment failure on site, or it could just be due to the design of the facility. So, so two out of the three of these facilities are fixed tilt facilities. Tail and Bend is quite far south, so the resources is, is a little bit less than facilities in, uh, in Queensland, for example. And with that, I'll hand back to Giles. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, David. Um, that was a fascinating thing, and I was particularly intrigued with the last couple of slides there about the various um, grid constraints and the, um, and the output of the solar farms, and that's certainly an issue for many people, um, as we've been reporting about in um, Renew Economy. Apologies to the ten attendees. Um, David, your sound did sort of drop out a couple of times. I'm not too sure whether you've got an issue with the headset or the plug, or maybe it's your internet. Um, maybe um, Max can help you out there or something like that. So maybe try and get in contact with him during the next session so we don't have that issue again. It was 90% good, but there were some unfortunate times where about 10% of the time where it just sort of dropped down to a lower level. So apologies to people um, um, if you're having trouble hearing at that stage. I'd next like to introduce um, Richard Chan. He's the project manager for Longi Australia. And um, he's going to tell you about the new technologies which are gonna be boosting efficiencies um, in the solar power industry. Richard, thanks for joining this webinar and you have the floor. Thank you, Joel. Uh, just let me share my screen. Hi everyone, I'm Richard, I'm product manager uh, from technical team here at Longy Solar Australia. Maybe we'll just take a little pause there, um, um, Richard. Do you want to sort of, um, if that's going to take you um, more than 30 seconds, maybe we can switch towards Andrew and, and, um, and have you come back. Um, Andrew, can you make a sign towards me about whether you're ready to do that? Yes, I'm ready. Fantastic. Richard, is that okay? I, I might just switch to Andrew and then we'll come yeah, back yeah, sure, to sure. the presentation. Okay. So look, sorry about that, but we, we do want to get the sound quality right. So look, um, we're going to do Andrew Blake. I'd like to introduce An Andrew. He's the Professor of Engineering at um, ANU. His subject is why Australia needs to lead the world in solar recycling. It's a very important topic, as you could understand. Um, Andrew, you have the floor. Okay, so I'm going to talk about um, the long term, where we might go. And um, at the second half, I'm going to talk about the consequences of that for PV panel waste. Are we going to drown in it or is it a non-problem? So I just want to start with pointing out that um, global annual net new generation capacity around the world is driven by solar PV, 95% of it silicon solar PV and wind. And uh, wind is about equal to fossil plus nuclear combined in terms of annual net new generation capacity. There's a um, bit of hydro, a bit of bio, and some very small amounts of the others. But really the game is all about silicon solar PV and wind. And it's difficult to see how that would change in the next decade. I'd also like to say that Australia is right at the top of the pack. This is the renewables deployment speed in terms of watts per person per year 
for wind and solar rooftop and utility solar uh, for 2018, the red bars, and 2019, the green bars. And uh, Australia is installing new capacity, for, uh, new renewable capacity, about four times faster than Japan, China, the USA, or uh, Europe, and about 10 times faster than the global average. So we really are the pathfinders. And a very important point is that Australia is a sunbelt country. We are where three quarters of the world's population lives. We are not where a small amount of wealthy countries live in the north. In order to cope with very large quantities of uh, solar and wind coming into the system, given that they're variable, it's great if you've got both wind and solar because the wind sometimes blows at night and the more diversity you have, the less storage you need. Um, wide geographical dispersion, which is helped out by strong interstate long distance transmission is also really important. You can reduce your storage requirements by a factor of five or more if you spread your solar and wind out over very large areas. Obviously demand management is important. We need to try and shift loads to the day instead of shifting them to the night. And we need interruptible loads. And all of this is reasonably straightforward. And finally, you do need storage in the end once you get to very high levels of renewables. And pumped hydro is where storage is at for large scale storage and batteries have an advantage for high power short term um, and that includes car batteries. So this graph shows the power and energy of Snowy 2.0 and the Hornsdale big battery after its upgrade and you can see that um, for large scale storage pumped hydro is where it's all at but um, batteries really have a very important role in short term high power storage. So we did a global uh, search of all the off-river pumped hydro sites in the world and we found about 600,000 of them which is about 100 times more than you'd need to support a 100% renewable energy system all outside national parks and urban areas and uh, you can go to our website and you can download any one of these 616,000 sites this is one down in Victoria near Yark and you can resolve it as uh, an upper and a lower reservoir and a tunnel route and, and um, a bunch of information about it. So essentially there is no problem almost anywhere on earth in terms of large scale long-term storage. So the notion that we have a problem with storage is simply not true. Between batteries and pumped hydro, we have a solution off the shelf now in um, multi hundred gigawatt scale. So as I mentioned, Australia is rapidly installing wind and solar. South Australia is particularly rapid and it really is, I think one of the, if not the, global leader. This is 1.7 million people and you can see that it's initially wind um, in the early parts of this century and then rapidly increasing rooftop solar and solar farms um, in the yellow and the red. Hey, Andrew, can I, can I just butt in? Can you just share full screen please? Um, some people aren't able to see the y-axis or is it the x-axis? Um, I think I am on full screen unfortunately. Um, okay. Well, is there something, it just, we're is getting, it, like, we're, we're not getting quite, we're not getting the bottom, the, the, the bottom line across, that's all. Okay. Um, well, looks like I can press a lot of slides there. There you go, that looks. Well, right, I'll, leave, I'll, I'll leave it like this then. Yeah, because we can, that, that makes it more visible. Thank you. Sure. Uh, so the, the national electricity market is up around 25% now and is um, basically, uh, I think, about five or six years behind South Australia. Uh, South Australia will probably go to 100% um, renewable electricity, maybe even more in the late 2020s. And there's no reason that the national electricity market can't be pushing up towards that level in the around about the same time frame or a few years later. But let's have a look at where we might end up. So in 2015-16, we were installing about one gigawatt per year of new solar and wind. Um, we're up around six point something gigawatts a year now, and that will probably be, uh, this is accreditation according to the Clean Energy Regulator, that'll probably also hold in 2020 and 2021. 
there's major problems with transmission as other speakers have alluded to because of the federal government effectively being on strike in terms of installing, uh, uh, making sure that the system keeps up with the install of renewables. But it's a fairly simple calculation to show that we need about um, 13 gigawatts per year or so of uh, wind and solar to get to zero emissions in 2050. So that's about a doubling from where we are now. And since we multiplied by six over the last four years, this is not a very hard thing to do. And in fact, um, will probably be zero net cost because the price of wind and solar just keeps going down. So when we get to 100% renewable energy, let's look at the PV panel waste that will be generated. The first point to note is that 100% renewable energy, as distinct from electricity, requires us to approximately triple electricity demand as we electrify everything, including aviation and industry and heating and transport. Solar PV uh, would require about 500 terawatt hours if it's split two to one between uh, wind and solar. Um, that's 360 gigawatts, about 14 kilowatts per person, and we'd also need 75 gigawatts of wind. So just focusing on the 500 terawatt hours, 360 gigawatts of uh, solar PV that we'd need, that's about 60 square meters of solar panel per person to supply not just their personal needs, but industry needs, transport, the whole lot. And given there's a 30 year panel life, we're looking at two square meters of solar panel retiring each year from 2050 onwards when we've got down to zero emissions and 100% renewables for everything, no more fossil fuels at all. So that weighs about 20 kilograms per year will be retiring. And just to put this in perspective, if you buy a car weighing 1500 kilograms and you retire it after 10 years, that's 150 kilograms of waste per year from cars. And uh, we are emitting about 20,000 kilograms per year per person in greenhouse gas emissions. So it's quite obvious that any problem we have with PV panel waste is trivial compared with other waste streams. But let's go a little further. So when you look at a solar PV panel, uh, it's basically glass and an aluminium frame. So the aluminium frame is easily removed and that would be recycled because it's, it's, uh, it actually pays you money to take that frame off and recycle it. Um, after the glass cover, there's small amounts of the silicon solar cell, um, plastic encapsulant and the conductive metals. And it's impossible to run out of the raw materials that go into a silicon solar panel because that's what the world's made of. And uh, they're all non-toxic. So to decompose this, uh, these panels at the end of life, you remove the aluminium frame and recycle it. That's very straightforward. Uh, there's a number of ways to disassemble, but perhaps the most straightforward is simply to put it through a standard um, thermal uh, incineration system and the plastic evaporates, the whole panel falls apart, you burn the evaporated plastic to keep the thing hot, you cycle the, re the recycle the glass, and that would add 40% to the waste stream in 2050 when there's no more fossil fuels. So you have to um, slightly enhance the glass waste stream, but the other materials only add um, about one part in 10,000 or so to the waste stream, so they really are not very important. So I conclude that the, um, the PV waste stream will not be significant even in the limit when fossil fuels have been completely displaced by solar and wind. Um, on occasion, the industry might get ahead of the waste recycling um, so that the recycling technology is not building up quite fast enough and lithium batteries are in a similar situation. But uh, we reach steady state eventually, just like the lead acid battery has reached um, steady state and the lead acid battery has near 100% recycling. And that's what will happen with both lithium batteries and the solar panel. So in conclusion, PV and wind are 99% of net new generation capacity in Australia because they're cheaper than coal and gas. Deep renewable electrification can eliminate 85% of greenhouse gas emissions by getting rid of all fossil fuels at about net zero cost by 2050 because costs just keep going down. We don't need any heroic assumptions about future technology. Uh, it's wind, solar PV, high voltage transmission, pumped hydro and batteries. It's, they're all off the shelf in very large quantity right now. And the prices for all will continue to go down. Waste PV, so, a solar PV waste problem is not a problem in the long term. We need to focus on it in the short term to make sure that the 
waste stream does not get too far ahead of the recycling capacity. And finally, transmission and storage are critical for 100% renewables. And the federal government needs to prioritise transmission in particular, or get out of the way and let the states do it. So thank you. Andrew, thank you very much. That's a fantastic presentation. And um, I just love that last slide as well, just sort of summarises basically all the questions which are posed um, about the transition to renewables. And I I think I particularly like that last one about sort of getting out of the way. Anyway, uh, if you do have any questions, please put, um, you've got your little um, button on the right hand side there, the Q&A, and there's also a chat screen as well. Now, Richard, um, we can uh, um, go back to Richard Chan, the uh, project manager for Longy Australia, um, hoping that we've resolved those um, audio problems. So Richard, welcome back. You have the floor and maybe you can sort of go through those first couple of slides reasonably quickly and then go into yeah, sorry about that before. Uh, I think I've got the quite nice gear right now. Hope it's better. Sounding good. Nice. So, um, yes, I think the, the, the most discussed topic recently uh, in the solar industry is power and the size of the solar module. And uh, it's been, um, uh, bo both features have been increased dramatically in, in relative short period of time compared to what we, we have seen in the last decade. So in case you have seen uh, uh, anything from the snack exhibition in Shanghai in, in a few days ago. Uh, some manufacturers um, showcased 600 or even 700 watt uh, panels, which in my opinion really confused uh, the, the customers of the PV in industry. Uh, high power truly brings benefit in terms of lowering BOS cost and LCOE. Everyone knows it, but um, the question is, does it mean the bigger, the, the better? So today, uh, I'm going to offer some insights on the design of our latest product and explain how we are combining size and power to achieve a better results with our uh, HIMO 5 series. So uh, we agree that the, the ultimate goal of uh, solar is to have the lowest LCOE. Uh, from a module, module uh, manufacturer's perspective, we need to develop a product that is the most uh, cost effective, being able to reduce uh, BOS cost and based on fundamentals like uh, reliability and system compatibility. The total value should be positive when making a, um, a comprehensive uh, evaluation. So uh, it, it's also consensus that increasing the power of module can reduce BOS cost and LCOE. Uh, there are many ways to achieve it. Uh, for example, continuing to improve the efficiency of perk cell, uh, which is still the most cost-effective technology at the moment employing a uh, half cell and a multibus bar on the module level. And among all the others, um, it's fine that the increasing module size by larger cells is probably the most effective solution. We've seen in the last two years where um, the emergence of G1 and M6 wafer size has driven down the cost of not only for solar module, but also the balance of system. And the smallest M2 is expected to be phased out by the end of 2020. So um, should we enlarge the wafer indefinitely or what is the optimal size? We, we keep this in mind before launching uh, Longji's M6 wafer in 2019. The specification was based on the analysis of existing cell and module equipment compatibility the cost of upgrading, as well as raw material supply like glass. The M6-based product, which is the HIMO 4, has over 6 gigawatt of uh, delivery and the capacity over 20 gigawatt. We've also seen the launch of uh, the G12 wafer from an, uh, another supplier, which is based on the logic that solar wafer should be in line with the semiconductor wafer. But how reasonable is it given that uh, no matter how big the wafer is, the chip size doesn't change. However, the solar, size, the solar cell size has a greater impact and determines all the downstream application and the system integration. Therefore, we need to analyze the boundaries and figure out the optimal size. Well, there are a couple of key factors that needs to be considered, for example, uh, the production feasibility and cost, uh, reliability, 
system compatibility, um, module installation, and the most limiting one, uh, transportation. Due to the fact that the module uh, have to be packaged vertically to avoid micro cracks, uh, the height of the container basically determines the maximum module widths. So after calculation and testing, um, the final cell size was settled down at 182 millimeter and it's called M10. So anything above that would definitely waste container space and therefore increasing the shipping cost. So if we go back and verify the boundary conditions, uh, it actually ticks all the boxes. It has a proper size and a weight that can be easily handled by two person. Uh, it has high production yield and, and supported by new glass capacity too. Uh, reliability concerns like mechanical load and hot spot can be easily overcome uh, despite of larger footprint and high current. And finally, uh, it has the inverter and tracker compatibility as well. So that's, that's how Hanwha 5 comes to uh, join the fleet. So um, let me just quickly show you its key features and technologies. Uh, once again, high efficiency per cell based on M10 wafer. Longji also used the gallium as dopant instead of boron so that the LID and LETID can be significantly improved. Also, the nine plus bar and a high uh, half cut cell, uh, which has been the industry standard. We've also kept the six row 72 cell format to maintain a reasonable uh, voltage and current. So the VOC is 49.5 uh, volt, which is uh, similar to previous model. In most of the cases in Australia, one strain will accommodate around 28 or 29 uh, modules per strain with operating current at uh, around 13 amps and temperature coefficient at 0.35% uh, per degree C. The dimension is 2.25 meters by 1.13. Uh, the weight of the double glass by facial module is 32.3 uh, kilogram. And it's, uh, it's around seven, uh, 27 for monofacial uh, single glass model. Here is another highlight, which is the smart soldering technology. So it's, the, uh, it's called the integrated segmented ribbon, uh, which is employed in, in, this, uh, in this model, HAMO5. So basically on the front side of the cell, it's the triangular section that uh, maximizes maximize the use of sunlight. When, when it comes to the uh, micro gap, as well as the rear side of the cell, the ribbon becomes flat. The design not only increased efficiency uh, compared with this uh, circular multiple spar product, but also reduces the tensile stress by 20%, uh, 20% which means uh, high reliability. By using the gallium doped wafer, uh, Longji is the first to offer power warranty on a P type per product at the lowest degradation rate. For example, for the bifacial model, almost 85% uh, of initial output can uh, still be guaranteed at the end of year 30. Now, currently we have two variants for HIMO5 available in both model and bifacial. Instead of uh, going further for the 78 cell format, uh, we decided to downsize to 66 cell. So this helps us to increase application scenarios uh, you can see the power of the smaller size can, can still reach 495 watt with the length below 2.1 meter. Speaking of the compatibility, we've uh, seen uh, more and more popularity um, of the strain inverter being employed in large scale solar farms. And uh, manufacturers like SunGrow, Huawei and SMA, who have just launched the strain inverters with 15 amp uh, input current. So in this case, there won't be power loss due to current limit, uh, even with a certain amount of bifacial gain. From the tracker point of view, once, once again, the dimension of HIMO5 uh, makes it much easier to cope with mainstream 1P and 2P single access trackers. And we've also been working with the tracker supplies and, and most recently some projects have been configured 
uh, with newly designed Tricon and HIMO5. So this is an overview of uh, what our HIMO5 product brings. Um, this is the capacity that uh, we plan to have a 12 gigawatt in 2021. Um, I'm happy to uh, provide more information if you want. Uh, my, my details will be at the uh, end, end of the presentation if you want to get in touch. But finally, uh, a little bit more about Longi. So Longi only started to sell the module business in uh, 2015. But uh, um, over the last couple of years, we've been expanding the production capacity. Uh, targeting and uh, scaling up leading technology and product from 1.5 gigawatt in 2015 to 30 gigawatt by the end of 2020. So in the meantime, the LCOE of solar has, has decreased more than 30%, which makes it one of the most competitive source of energy generation. Our product portfolio is pretty simple. We have eight models in total, uh, including monofacial and bifacial. The M6-based HIMO4 in a, in a smaller footprint will remain the most cost-effective solution and accounts for the majority of the shipment in 2021. Um, 20 gigawatt will, uh, of capacity will be allo allocated to HIMO4 with the uh, launch of HIMO5. Longis product portfolio is, is suited for a um, very wide range of application from residential rooftop to ultra large uh, power station. So that's uh, that's all from me. Uh, as I said, our, our team is always available to talk about the product and uh, any projects you have in uh, uh, in more details. So thank you very much and join the session today. Back to you, Joe. Thank you very much, Richard. And um, look, it was great. I'm glad we got the sound quality re resolved. And um, thank you for everyone for your forbearance on that. And um, look, a fascinating little presentation there. Just the last couple of slides just showing the growth of Longi. And I guess that sort of mirrored the growth of the solar industry um, overall. And when we think about um, over the last 10 years, I mean, you know, from a few solar panels and a couple of trial and demonstration plants and um, costs have since fallen about 90, 95% and over those 10 years and um, seem to continue to fall. And um, I'm sure we'll see some more efficiency improvements coming over the next five, 10, 15, 20 years. Look, we do have some questions here and um, I'd love to um, get onto them. So if everyone can possibly open their mics. Um, we've got a couple, um, well, we had, um, has someone been answering the questions as we're going along? Um, just one, just, um, uh on the oh the, i had one here about the um the um i had a question here about recycling but anyway i can't find that right now um andrew maybe one for you some people are asking questions about snowy 2 versus battery storage um it's an interesting debate and a lot of people have very strong views um about this um, the question is, Snowy 2.0 has a long way to 2627. Battery costs are still high, pump storage costs are still high, and new TX costs, I'm too sure that is, will be high due to cost even when built. How do you think real acceleration will come from the mid-2020s or late-2020s? I think there was a related question about um, um, battery storage versus Snowy 2.0. Uh, well, I, I disagree that the cost of transmission and um, storage is high. It's actually not very high. Um, when you do the sums for a high level of renewables, say 60, 70, 80 percent, um, the, the cost of the renewable generation capacity, that's the wind and the solar, is three quarters or more of the cost of the whole system needed, including the transmission and storage. So you do need the transmission, but it is not a large fraction of the total cost. As for the time frame, uh, transmission is the key for the next five or six years. Um, we need transmission, transmission. We've still got legacy coal and gas that substitutes for storage. Um, Snow 2.0 in the um, middle of this decade is around about the right time frame, and it's not either or. We need Snow 2.0, and we need batteries, and we need electric vehicle batteries, and we need demand and management, and we need transmission. We need it all. Thank you very much for that. Hey, one for either you or maybe even David. Um, there was a question about the, um, and I, I think um, one thing things highlighted by you, David, was some of the grid connection problems and things like this. 
And the question here is, the slow response of the industry to the necessary changes, is it just protecting the status quo? Are they honestly scared of making mistakes? I'm not really too sure where that's actually looking for, but I guess maybe just a comment, David, about some of those um, issues that we're seeing with constraints and that wonderful slide that you had that will show where some people are being sort of cornered there. Um, what, what, what's the basic issue that we're seeing there very quickly? Yeah, sure. Um, so there, there, there's, I think there's a bit to unpack in, in that question. Um, so, I mean, and Andrew's kind of rightly pointed out on the transmission side, just the time it takes to get transmission through the approval process. And then even once you get it through the approval process and get built, you're still talking about a number of years. So, I mean, if you're lucky, it's a five year lead time from when you put in uh, your first submission to actually getting transmission built. Um, sorry, Giles, are we having issues with audio? Can you hear me okay? You're on mute, Giles. <laughs> sorry, I forgot to unmute. No, I did unmute. Yes, sorry, yeah. I was just, uh, I was just, uh, Finding the question, of it. No, keep going, David. Sorry, it was yeah. So, um, so the, the the timeline for transmission is an is an obvious issue. Um, that with regards to connection and 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 and, and essentially curtailment of the solar facilities, um, the, it's really important to go back to 2017 and 18 and realise the context at which these solar facilities and and to a lesser extent the wind facilities, but still. Um, the issues are, are there is that when they were making their investment decisions back in 2017 and 18, um, it, it wasn't so transparent as to how many developers were looking to build in certain areas. So if you were to look a map of NEM facilities, so coal, gas, hydro, everything back in 2017 and look at the MLFs on the map, you would have seen no generators up near Mildura. Uh, so it would have been uh, quite a prime location to put a utility PV farm. Uh, by MLF point of view, Broken Hill was probably the best location in the country back in 2017. It was about 1.28, 1.25, 1 1.28. And everywhere north of Gladstone was above 95%. Um, and then came essentially the flurry of investment in 2017 and 18 and uh, essentially saturated the market for the utility PV, uh, particularly utility PV, which soared large MLF re reductions, particularly last year, and declines in system strength. Um, whether or not these issues could have been properly foreseen is another question. Um, but, but certainly the response, uh, as you've kind of likely alluded to, has been reactive rather than, than proactive in the industry. Yeah. Yeah, it certainly seems like a problem that needs to be resolved somehow. And I think there's a bit of unhappiness about these sort of the problems that we're getting to now. But at least we have a plan for the future. We've just got to get rid of the, um, solve the problems of the present. Hey, Richard, a couple of questions for you. Um, one question is here, is Longy looking at solar roof tiles? <laughs> um, actually, uh, we just had a massive uh, launch at the Snack Shanghai Show uh, with our BIPV product. Um, it's, it's more like... Uh, it's it's more like it's it's can be used like facade for for a, a building, uh, but not really a roof tiles. Um, but that's definitely uh, what we are looking at. Uh, it's it's a huge uh, potential for uh, PV. Excellent. And we've got another question too about price rises. I think someone's citing there's a recent problem in a silicon factory in China, I think, uh, maybe a fire yes. which um, caused some supply. What's been happening there? Have prices been forced up by the lack of silicon and the competition for that? And um, how long do you, if, if it has happened, how long is that likely to, um, um, how long is that likely to be affecting the market? Um, yes, I think this, this question is more suitable for, I'm actually with my colleague, Tommy, uh, who is the uh, business head, uh, head, head of business. So regarding the price, maybe you can make some comments. Hey, oh yeah. So what's your question, was it? Uh, the price. I no, it was, it was just a quick one about the, um, there, there was just a couple of questions about price and um, obviously overall the overall price of, um, of solar mm. PV is going down, but there's been a bit of a blip recently because of the silicon fire. So what's been the impact on the market and how, how, how long do you expect that to last? So, uh, you know, uh, from a month ago, so the price is very fluctuating right now. So we've seen the price uh, getting increased, the reason because the shortage of silicon and then, you know, shortage of the some material that 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 all the facts the impact to our pricing increased dramatically. 
Mm, okay. We'll move on to some other ones. There's some recycling questions here, um, Andrew, and I'm just trying to find them. How much pollution does incinerating the plastic components and panels produce? If it's a proper incinerator, zero. Uh, you, you emit steam and carbon dioxide in very small quantities. If you've got a proper scrubber, you don't emit uh, anything else. And you're uh, evaporating the plastic and you're burning it uh, to keep the incinerator hot and uh, none of the other materials will emit any gases. So it's, it's just the standard, bog standard, uh, high quality incinerator that you need, nothing to invent. Mm -hmm. Okay, I've got an interesting question here about someone asking about why not have a standard solar cell design then simply replicate the active component when performance drops, keep frame, glass and wiring other than the actual cell wiring. Um, Andrew, actually, I think you might have actually answered that one, but maybe, maybe make for a more general answer. Um, no one wants to use 30 year old tech. So why would you ever want to um, recycle any part of a 30 year old solar panel? The glass is, the, is not as good. The silicon cells are woeful compared with modern cells. Um, you, you just start again, just like in a mobile phone or any other tech. Mm, fair enough. Um, okay, now um, I'm just going to have to um, get, I'm just looking at the maybe one for you, Richard, um, or even um, David. But Richard, maybe have a first go at this. There's a couple of questions talking about sort of delivering um, outcomes for solar farms in Australia and how it compares to the global average. Now, obviously, there are incidents. I mean, there, there, there's, there's been grid constraints and things like that. But overall, has, has the delivery, the, um, the capacity to deliver, the output delivered, um, pretty much met your expectations? Uh, yes, uh, we've actually got pretty good feedback from our customer in terms of the performance of the solar module, uh, the generation. And uh, we also got like more than 30 like pilot projects around the globe, uh, which we've been constant, constantly monitoring performance. And uh, what we see is that the performance is normally higher than the, for example, the simulation from the so, uh, like PVCs, the, these kind of software. Uh, yes, it's definitely the performance is, is uh, getting better. Mm, okay. We've got another question more broadly about the industry and the installations. It's about EPC contractors. And David, this might be one for you. Um, when an EPC and developer enter into a new project, doesn't the contract have the penalty clauses if it can be, can't be connected to the grid? Or is it one-sided? And look, just a bit of background for those who don't know. Um, obviously, a lot of contractors and developers um, have been haggling over what's called liquidated damages, which is the sort of the fee, the, the fine that you pay if it's not connected. But my understanding, David, is that this has been a problem and is now a point of great dispute between people when they're actually entering the contracting market, trying to eliminate that risk, because it seems that um, some of the connection issues either aren't foreseen or can't be controlled in some circumstances. So who holds the potato? Yeah, sure. So I think there was um, an historical context with regard to that question, most notably, I guess, with, with RCR as, as one example, but they also had uh, other issues with construction on site. Um, so the ins and outs of the, the contract are obviously confidential, so I wouldn't be able to say um, who's definitely holding the potato now, but I would comment to say that the location in the grid obviously has a significant capacity to your ability to connect and go through the connection and the hold point testing. So essentially, where, where are you in the grid? Are you in an area of high system strength? Uh, so are you in um, next to Cogan Creek? Or are you in far north Queensland or northwest Victoria, in which case the system strength is not, so, uh, is, is, is not there and it might be a lot more difficult to connect and you're already connecting to a, a transmission line that's already congest congested. And that is largely not the EPC's uh, choice to be in any particular location. So in my mind, it's actually bizarre that as an EPC, you would be willing to take on a project with that risk if you know it's in a location that is challenged in terms of grid connection and system strength. Thank you very much, David. Look, um, maybe just one final question just to wrap up on, and maybe I can point to um, bring Andrew in on this one. There's been a couple of questions about policy and future development, and I guess um, maybe even David as well. Um, we'll try and keep it quick. Um, I guess, you know, people are talking about, well, we've got a plan now that might not be in place for another five years, some of that new investment. What's the chances of actually happening in 
things taking off and what do we need? Um, um, do we have, what are the chances of actually getting past the impact, impasse in Canberra? Andrew, you've got 20 or 30 seconds to answer this question. Um, state governments just have to decide that they're going to dump the federal aspect and build their own renewable energy zones. That means pick a, a, wind, a sunny, windy spot, perhaps with pumped hydro available as well, um, upgrade or put in a you know, multi like 10 gigawatt power line to that spot and go ahead and do it. In fact, the best renewable energy zone in the whole of Australia is the electorate of Angus Taylor, which has got great wind, great sun, and this is located around Goulburn in New South Wales. It's on the trunk line of any new power lines into Sydney. That would be my number one choice of a renewable energy zone. And see if he decides whether it decides to reject uh, someone offering to spend $10 billion in his own electorate. Well, there's already been a large renewable energy zone proposed for Barnaby Joyce's electorate, so it seems only fitting that it should, the next one should go into Angus Taylor's electorate. So I think that's a mighty fine idea. Um, David, you talked to a lot of developers, presumably, out there. What are the three things they want to hear from the government? I mean, are they relying on the states and corporate demand, or do they want something more um, on, the, on the federal level? Yeah, so, I mean, last year it was very much just... The, the, the clarity around the MLF process, as, you, as I'm sure you'd expect with large downgrades, particularly for utility PV and, and wind developers. Um, we don't, the, the federal policy, it, I mean, it's obviously a challenge with a, a government that's less favorable to renewables, um, yeah, but really it's just transmission capacity. Um, getting transmission capacity in the system uh, that gives some kind of certainty on MLF over the long term with system strength is really what we're seeing in the markets. Um, obviously state and the, the other key one is securing offtake. And that's where state governments say in Queensland through CleanCo, you can really, uh, and the VRET I guess in Victoria has been a successful program in the sense of, uh, of attracting wind and solar investment in the state. Um, those are the two big things that the governments can really do at a state level. Richard, I'm going to throw the last question to you. You've talked about, you know, the latest um, um, HOMO 5 module. Um, we're going up in capacity. How big will solar panels get in terms of capacity and actually sort of size? I've just noticed that they're getting bigger and um, obviously in large scale projects that will um, um, to, to accommodate that. But um, are we going to see 1,000 watt panels at one stage? Are we going to see even bigger ones? And, and, and um, does all that have to be sort of contained within a manageable space? Because you do actually have to carry the things and uh, to put on rooftops and, uh, and, um, and, and racking systems out in, the, out in the wild? Yes, it's a good question. And then that, that's a uh, very, very uh, topic that we've been thinking about. As I mentioned in the presentation, uh, we've come up with this 182 millimeter size uh, by examining different factors uh, like uh, is it able to be uh, easily handled uh, or uh, the weight and transportation the compatibility with all the supply chains so that's that's really important when uh, like solar module manufacturer to develop a product so but I don't think in a very short time uh, that size will be changed anymore um, but, but anything is possible, so let's see. <laughs> we don't quite know what the future might hold. Look, I think we're going to wrap it up there. Um, there are some more questions. We will attempt to sort of um, reply to those um, later on. Do remember that the slides and the um, webinar itself, the audio recordings, will be available on the Renew Economy website um, within a day or two. So please do look out for that. Um, we'd like to thank all the attendees. Um, fantastic turnout. And um, apologies for some of the audio problems that we had at the beginning. But look, we resolved those. And, um, and thank you very much to our tech assistants. Thank you very much to Andrew Blake, who's from the ANU. It was great to hear your perspective, Andrew. Thank you for joining us. Um, also to David Dixon from Rystad Energy. Um, fantastic insight into the state of the market. And also Richard Chan from Longy Solar um, and for Longy for sponsoring this session. Um, thank you all very much. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Um, you'll find it up on the website. And please do keep on reading Renew Economy. Bye for now.